Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you can always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. And be sure to add our podcast in the How Did You Hear About Podgo section of the application. Good evening. You are listening to Ye Old Crime with Lindsay and Madison. A true crime podcast hosted by sisters. How very ye knew. My name is Lloyd Warrington, the chief engineer of Mask. The Ministry of Augmented Something Something, and a K. Or perhaps you know me as the host of Down to Fork, a podcast documenting little-known tales of lore and legend that never really existed. Welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Sengel. Hello. Hi. Good morning. So we have a correction this week. No. We do. All right, let's open the cubby. What's going on? Did, did, did I, did we insult anyone? Maybe. Oh, shit. Okay. So I would like to thank user Cammy on Podbean for commenting on the fact that I made a comment in our Elizabeth Bathory episode that didn't make much sense and may have come across as offensive. <gasps> okay. So at one point in the episode, I said otherwise known in the white person way in regards to a Hungarian word that I struggled to pronounce, which I meant to s- saying that like Hungarians aren't white. And that's kind of how it came across, because I I meant to say in the dumb American way, because I don't speak Hungarian and foreign languages are really hard for me. So, yes, I am aware that Hungarians are white. And if anyone from Hungary was insulted by that or offended by that, I do apologize. I will endeavor to do better in the future and make sure that I'm just like, (laughs) I'm a dumb American. So you can just say in my own dumb way. In my own dumb way. And just be on your own dumb island. We can like be the populace of that island. And if anyone wants to join, we can. I'm so sorry. Like that, yeah. yeah, I can see that. I can absolutely see that. Thank you, Cammy, for bringing that up. Because um, you forget that uh, uh, white on white racism is still very much a thing. Prejudice is alive and well, no matter what you look like and where you're from. Mm-hmm. So. And since we're talking about racism and stuff like that, I do want to bring up the fact that I'm really not cool with the whole discriminating against Asians thing that's going on right now. That's super not okay. It's been going on for a while. It's really ramped up recently. And it's not okay. And as someone who is very close friends with a lot of people who are members of the Asian American community, I need you to know that I stand with you. And we are a podcast that does not tolerate racism of any kind. And yeah, knock it off. It's not okay. Yeah, it's still very much a thing, especially in Minneapolis. I've had friends who have experienced it. I have heard a lot of stories and, uh, It's something you can't really fathom until it happens to you or to someone you care about. We just, we stand with you. And if there's anything we can do aside from bringing awareness to it. Yeah. We're not expecting you to tell stories of your trauma. We're not expecting you to teach us on how to not be racist bigots (laughs) because we should take the time to learn that ourselves. That's part of the process. But seriously, uh, stay strong. We are with you. We're going to get off our soapbox now, but I just wanted to address that because that's something that is important to me. And Mm -hmm. I want it to be known that we are a podcast that does not condone that type of behavior or that type of language. And the cubby shows we're willing to learn, too. Yep. We're willing to admit our Mm -hmm. mistakes because they're going to happen. We're human. We're not perfect. And I've I've said numerous times in this podcast that I'm kind of dumb. So 
again, my apologies. I'm going to I'm going to close the cubby now. OK, so we are continuing Wicked Mock Madness. Is this the la- no, there's one more after this. There's right? one more after this one. Oh, my gosh, Mark. You're getting so much. You get so many episodes, Mark. All the witches. Yeah. Who's the witch or witchy group for today? Who's the spoopy group? Today, we are going to be talking about the Wizard of Westbo. It sounds like like a performance act. It's pretty bananas, and I am very excited to tell you about it. So information for this episode was pulled from the following sources. A 2020 Mysterious Universe article by Brent Swanser. A 2020 Hub Pages article by Shin Kicker. 2018 R. Edinburgh Friends article. 2017 My Plaid Heart blog post. 2014 Edinburgh News article by David McLean. 2013 The Spooky Isles article by MJ Steele Collins. A Clan.com article by Sophie Carricker. The Gazetteer for Scotland, Jenny.com, and Wikipedia. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. So as you may have guessed, this takes place in Scotland. Awesome. Surprise! A wizard. Not a warlock, though. A wizard. No, he's a wizard, Harry. Edinburgh is no stranger to witchcraft. The great Scottish witch hunt of 1597 attests to that. And for today's tale, we're going to be traveling to the 17th century to hear of one of Old Town Edinburgh's most bizarre cases, that of Major Thomas Weir, the Wizard of Westbo. Ooh, he was a major. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. wonder if he used his magic to become a major. We'll see. I think he earned it. Major Thomas Weir was born in 1595 into one of the most powerful and oldest families in the county, born near Carluck, now known as South Lanarkshire, to powerful parents, Thomas Weir, Laird of Kirkton, and Lady Jean Somerville, who was reported as having clairvoyant powers. Ooh. He was one of three children and the only son. His sister, Jean, was born in 1597. (laughs) Jean Jr. And Jonay was born in 1600. All right. Major Weir moved to Edinburgh in the late 1600s, signed the Solemn League and Covenant in 1643 during the First English Civil War. Okay. And became an officer in the Scottish Anti-Royalist Army. Ooh, so a rebel. Mm Mm-hmm. High-ranking rebel. He served as a lieutenant in Ulster during the Irish Rebellion of 1641 before becoming commander of the Edinburgh Town Guard in 1650 after his retirement from active military service, thus earning him the rank of major. Nice. Congratulations. It sounds like you went through a bunch of atrocities to get where you were. Where you are today. Just kidding. You're very dead. <laughs> You're <laughs> soup's dead. No magic can fix that. Nope. At some point, and I couldn't find out when during my research, he married Margaret Borden, who bore him a son in 1625 that was also named Thomas. There is also no known birth or death date for Margaret. She lived forever. She's still around. Genie.com lists her possible birth date as early as 1562, which would have made her 63 when she had her son, or as late as 1622, which seems highly unlikely as she would have been three years old when she gave birth to her son. I hope to God that's not true. (laughs) Which I'm pretty sure is not medically possible. (laughs) Definitely use magic for that birth. So that just means to say at some point he was married we don't know how old she was and she died at some point and we don't know when wow and and on women's history month great Mm -hmm. they really did not record women well at all during that no and i like went down the rabbit hole trying to find stuff and there was like literally nothing about her in fact genie.com was the only place that i found any information on her at no Mm -hmm. other point in my research did they even mention her well dang So I'm surprised we even know her name, to be quite honest. So sorry, Margaret. I'm sorry, Margaret. West Bow is the name of the neighborhood in which Major Weir lived, specifically in the Lawn Market District, an area of Edinburgh near the high end of Royal Mile that's located near Victoria Street and Victoria Terrace. So he was highfalutin. There he owned a home that he occupied with his unmarried sister, Jean, who also went by the name of Grizel, which sounds very, I don't know. She's trying to be exotic, but it's also like an aggressive name. It is. Grizel. Like what if she was just like this really beautiful woman, like ethereal, and they're like, what is your name? And she's like, Grizel. And you're like, oh, okay. You picked that from Jean. Awesome. Good choice. 
Well, and fun fact, if you were unmarried and over the age of what was it, 25, you weren't called a spinster anymore. You were called a thornback. I remember that. I was a, I was a thornback. For a while. Oops, for a bit. <laughs> thornback Grizel. <laughs> <laughs> Just wandering down the street. Sounds like a pro wrestler. So being city commander was a very important position at that time in history, as Edinburgh was often attacked. And in 1670, at the age of 75, Major Weir stepped down from his position due to his age and failing health. Even so, he continued to be a faithful member of his strict Calvinist sect known as the Bowhead Saints. And he was well known for his piety, extensive knowledge of the Bible, and passion for the word of God. So he was a serial killer? (laughs) <laughs> no <laughs> because he was a pillar of the community <laughs> that's how it goes <laughs> every time I hear stuff like that I'm like okay so he murdered great great cool, cool. <laughs> I see where this is going <laughs> so one would think he sounds like a monk but he did have his quirks it said that he would walk around town wearing all black always holding a black walking stick and had a rather grim countenance, which wasn't helped by his rather large nose. So I'm just picturing like a Puritan version of Severus Snape. Yeah. Like if Severus Snape and Lucius Malfoy merged together. Interesting. And were a Calvinist. (laughs) Major Weir held regular religious gatherings at his home in Westbow, sharing his knowledge of the church and Presbyterian teachings with the locals who often referred to him as Angelic Thomas. That's really funny that he was so gothic looking and they called him Angelic Thomas. Yep. You're like a dark angel. (laughs) Is that man death? He could be death. I don't really know. His nose makes me think death. (laughs) (laughs) It's very plague doctor. Yes. In fact, it was at these very religious meetings that he soon began a sort of public confession, shattering the image of him as a pious and upstanding man of faith to the horror of his friends and neighbors alike. Uh Uh-oh. Foreshadowing. As his health started to decline, it was as if he needed to confess his sins before it was too late to do so. He quickly went from being slightly eccentric to full-on crazy town. Lord Provost Sir Andrew Ramsay at first dismissed the rumors of Major Weir's misdeeds as the ramblings of an old man in an effort to hush it up. Yeah, it's probably his PTSD creeping out and finally catching up to him after a lifetime of violence and war. Well, medical intervention concluded that the major was suffering nothing more than a guilty conscience and was, in fact, of sound mind. Oh, that's a medical diagnosis. Yep. Oh, got it, got it. Even with this diagnosis, the public refused to believe that the major could have committed any of the acts that he claimed to have committed. Almost as if viewing it as a challenge, Major Weir continued to up the ante of his confessions, revealing secret dealings with sorcery, the black arts, and witchcraft, in addition to committing adultery several times during his marriage. Ooh, pillar of the community, my butt. Even more startling, he admitted to performing acts of bestiality with horses and cows throughout his life and enjoying an incestuous relationship with his sister, Jean. There's that pillar of community. Good afternoon. Eventually, the allegations he laid upon himself and his sister just became too much for the public to stand, and he was soon arrested along with his sister. Both were held at the old Tollbooth Jail in the Royal Mile, a jail that at that time was already almost 300 years old, even though it had been renovated in 1561 on the orders of Mary, Queen of Scots. I'm sorry, but I just think of like medieval renovations as like more rocks. (laughs) <laughs> it's not like it's gonna have like nice fabric curtains and like it was pretty stuff. much just more rocks because a lot of the i think the outside they said was starting to like crumble so they basically mm-hmm. just like reinforce the walls with more rocks this will fix it newly renovated more rocks <laughs> <laughs> now has sea rocks Instead of proclaiming her innocence and denying the rumors of her carnal relations with her brother, Jean corroborated his testimony, stating that they had started their illicit relationship when she was 10. Nope. Oh, God. Okay. And it had only stopped recently when he stopped being attracted to her. And she even made further claims that he was indeed aligning himself with the devil. I mean, somebody who starts a sexual relationship with their sister at the age of 10 probably has some evil in him, though I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, he would have been 12 that time. 
Gene claimed that his famous walking stick, made of black thorn wood with a hand-carved handle in the form of a human head, had been enchanted by the devil and given to him as a gift. The walking stick was said to be able to walk on its own and capable of being wielded to do the Major's dark bidding. Ooh, kind of like um, the cape for Doctor Strange. Kind of. Only it's a walking stick. Mm-hmm. And less threatening unless it like can wield itself as a spear. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, oh, never mind. <laughs> Crossing the street now. Don't worry, I doubted you. You look like a floating bat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> when this new allegation came to light, many of the Edinburgh locals came forth as having witnessed the demonic walking stick in action, claiming <laughs> they had actually seen it moving in front of the major as he walked down the street in his familiar long cloak, the walking stick moving under its own power. That would be pretty scary. It would. Jean admitted to herself becoming involved in the dark arts along with her brother, including the fact that she regularly spoke to the devil, who appeared to her in the form of an unusually tall old woman. I don't like that. An unusually tall old woman. Yeah. I Honestly, though, that's like the most unfrightening version of the devil I've ever heard so far. See, and I just thought of like Baba Yaga right away. I was like, Ugh. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I can just... Maybe the devil was going through a phase at that point and just wanted to try something new. (laughs) I'm going to try out this look. I'm really tired of being a goat man. I just want (laughs) to express myself and experiment and become a terrifyingly tall lady. (laughs) I think the 1600s is my year. Mm -hmm. That was his uh, rumspringa where he just like deviated from his normal. (laughs) Sorry, Amish. (laughs) That was his time to party (laughs) and change. From the versions of the devil that I've heard, that's the most different because he's usually like an animal or a goat man or like. It seems like the most benign version of the devil. Yeah. Aside from like dolls. Yeah. Small children. Nope. I'm a little girl. (laughs) Gross. She claimed the devil had marked her with a horseshoe shaped mark on her forehead, which she freely showed to authorities. Jean admitted to performing black magic and rituals and necromancy, which they had learned from their mother, who she claimed Uh was a powerful witch. Additionally, she claimed that she and her brother had practiced animal sacrifice and that Mm. she had been given the supernatural ability to spin yarn at an unnatural speed. Oh, my God. So they're literally like every German fairy tale known to man. Uh, She's like Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah. So it's like a very dark Fantasia. Mm hmm. Instead of the broom, it's a walking stick. It's like Grimm's fairy tales all up in here. Yeah. Maybe they heard that and that's how they created Rumpelstiltskin. Maybe. So what was the name she went by? Grim- Grizel. Grizel. Mm-hmm. I mean. Who knows? Grizel Rumpelstiltskin. It checks out. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. Jean continued her testimony by confessing that in 1651, her brother had taken a ghostly, fiery carriage down the Royal Mile during the dead of night to come home to Westbow on more than one occasion. Nobody noticed the fire carriage? Well, look at there. Okay. Described as being pulled by a group of phantom horses that were engulfed in flames, it stopped outside his home before taking him and Jean across Grass Market to the country village of Old Dalkeith, the carriage looking like a ball of fire as it roared down the street. The major himself claimed that during the journey to Dalkeith, a strange man had told him that the Scots had lost the Battle of Worcester, which had coincidentally taken place the previous day and wouldn't become common knowledge in Edinburgh for another week. Hmm. Many Edinburgh citizens claimed to have seen the demonic carriage as well, and it soon looked as if the Major's fate was sealed. Yeah, I think you would notice and you would definitely hear a large ball of flame going past your house because fire is not quiet. Nope. Especially if it's moving. The bunch of like flaming horses. Yeah, horsepower. Major Thomas Weir was charged with incest, adultery, and bestiality, tried on April 9th, 1670, and ultimately found guilty and sentenced to be, quote, strangled at the stake between Edinburgh and Leith on Monday following the 11th of April and his body be burned to ashes, end quote. It's not hanging, strangling? Strangling. So like somebody is just going to strangle him until he dies. Mm -hmm. You've never heard that. Yeah, like he was going to be garroted and then burned at the stake. Mm. He was old by this point, right? He was like 75, yeah. Oh, that's not that old. 
Although not formally charged with witchcraft, Major told the court that he had lain with the devil who appeared to him as a beautiful woman. Yeah, the devil really had, he was really like exploring. Mm -hmm. Good on you, devil. Wow. Jean was also tried and charged with sorcery, witchcraft, and conversing with a familiar spirit in addition to her part in the incestuous relationship. The only proof of their relationship came in the form of testimony from their own sister, Janae, who told the court she had once caught them naked in bed together. I can totally picture the sister be like, I saw them. It was frigging gross. They were naked in the same bed. I don't know why. I don't like it. I don't like it. I, don't like it. I wonder what age. I don't know. I didn't say. Jean was sentenced to be, quote, hanged on the Tuesday morning in the grass market of Edinburgh, end quote, publicly in front of thousands of spectators. In the 17th century, grass market was the usual place of execution for public hangings. So it was quite shocking indeed when, as a final act of defiance, Jean Weir ripped off her clothes and screamed obscenities at the crowd before her death at the end of the noose. I read that it was actually, she was screaming and ripping off her clothes until finally the hangman just like booted her off the platform. Dang. She was 73 years old at the time of her death. Major Weir's death sentence was much more severe. As someone who dabbled in witchcraft, he was taken to the pyre of the stake at the Galilee. In modern Edinburgh, the site of his execution is located on Leith Walk near Pilrig Church. Prior to his death, he was asked if he wished to repent and beg for forgiveness. In response, he is quoted as saying, quote, Let me alone. I will not. I have lived as a beast and I must die as a beast, end quote. I mean, at least he knows that what he did was pretty awful. Yep. The major was strangled to death before his body was tied to the stake and he was burned. His immolation was supposed to cleanse his soul and rid him of the evil that had taken hold of his body while he was alive. He was 75 at the time of his execution. His demonic walking stick was also thrown into the funeral pyre, and people who witnessed his execution claimed that the stick writhed in agony like a great serpent before it was consumed by flames. Yes. That's so gross. Jean Weir was buried with the ashes of Major Thomas Weir at Shrub Hill near where Pilrig Street is today. And you might think this is the end of our story, but it's not. Uh Uh-oh. This is where shit gets weird because now we're going to talk about ghosts. Oh, I love ghosts. Yay. It wasn't long after his execution that the people started to see the ghost of Major haunting the streets of Westbow. Strange flashes of light, noises, and music could be seen and heard emitting from his now vacant home. Not only that, but people reported other human figures peeking out the windows from his house. Shadow figures that barely looked human at all, such as that of an old woman, an unusually tall and terrifying old woman. The devil. The devil. She wasn't ready to party, but she was like, hey... This is my house now. It's also said that the sounds of cackling and unearthly howls could also be heard, along with the hum of Jean's spinning wheel. The devil's still making her work. Yep. As a result of all this, the old home of Major Weir lay vacant for over a century. Such was the lingering fear of the house amongst the people of Edinburgh. There were also stories of the ghost of Major Weir riding astride a headless black horse that gallops through a cloud of flame. He really likes those flame carriages, doesn't he? He likes flaming horses. They're kind of his yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. It's like chariot of fire. Dun, 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 dun. He's like, I'm dead, but I'm not, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until 1780 that a couple, ex-soldier William Patulo and his wife, ignored the rumors and advice of the locals and took possession of the home. They lasted one night. Really? The next day, they told the story of how as they lay in bed, they heard a clopping sound. And waking up, they stared into the eyes of a ghostly calf that had its four legs upon their bed. The clopping sounds that had woken them were the sounds of its hooves, and they soon fled the house and refused to return. So they just woke up to the cow, like a cow on the bed, and it scared them? Yeah, just like a ghostly cow on their bed. Honestly, that's really funny that, like, I I was expecting, like, flames or, like... A walking stick doing like a spear baseball bat thing, but it was just a cow, like a ghost cow. That's what got him. Thomas Stevenson, the father of famous author Robert Louis Stevenson, often terrified his son with stories about the Wizard of Westbow and how he and everyone else in Westbow would be awakened by the sounds of Major's devil carriage roaring down the lane. Is it like those um those cars in cul-de-sacs that have like the whistles, ye old whistle cars? 
Maybe. And it's it's funny because I guess Robert Louis Stevenson years later would like like noted about how he would have frequent frequent nightmares about stories of the Wizard of Westbow because of his dad. Damn it, dad. Sir Walter Scott was quoted in 1830 as saying, quote, It is certain that no story of witchcraft or necromancy, so many of which occurred near and in Edinburgh, made such a lasting impression on the public as that of Major Weir. The remains of the house in which he and his sister lived are still shown at the head of the Westbow, which has a gloomy aspect well suited for a necromancer, end quote. Mm. The Major's home remained empty until 1830, when it was finally torn down and replaced with a new building in 1865, an Italian Gothic chapel that was, at that time, known as Kirkhouse. So it turned into a chapel? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Turns out that the Kirk House is now home to the Quaker Meeting House on Victoria Terrace. An academic from Cardiff named Dr. Jan Bondison visited the property in 2014 to learn more about historic Edinburgh and made a rather startling discovery. Not all of the Major's house had been destroyed as was believed. Uh-oh. Unlike the legends that say that the house was razed to the ground, parts of the building had been preserved and incorporated into the stone building that now sits where his home used to be. They even incorporated large sections of the original stonework into the construction of the building. And it was only after this discovery was made that the Quakers finally revealed that sightings of his ghost were still being seen to this day. Wow. There have been several reports of an elderly man walking the floors of the Quaker meeting house wearing clothes typically found in the late 17th century. And what part of the building exactly was built with sections of the major's old home? The toilets. Owning Myrtle. And that is the story of Major Thomas Weir, the Wizard of Westbow. Well, at least if he scares the shit out of you, it's like in a nice place. <laughs> at least you can flush it afterwards. <laughs> yeah. The cleanup is easy. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? I think it's crazy. But I'm like, still, it's in line with pillars of the community, man. It was got something. Instead of murder, it was weird sex stuff. <laughs> yep. Folklore. Fairy tales. Legends. These are traditions from time immemorial, passed from generation to generation. They explain the unknown. They warn against danger. They guide our moral fiber, instilling in us a sense of purpose and goodness. These tales are central to our very being, reminding us that we're one and the same. There is a magic in these stories. So we want to bring these tales to you, to take you into the fold. You'll learn. You'll grow. And the best part... We're making it all up. That's right. We're completely full of shit. Join us for Down to Folk at DTF Stories across all social media, DTFStories.com, and wherever podcasts are found. And this week's podcast plug is Down to Folk. A new podcast by Ariel and Chad, where they regale you with folklore, fairy tales, and legends that never actually happened. That's awesome. It's really funny. And you may have noticed that Lloyd from Mask will have taken over sections of our show today. He does oh. that. And he does that on Down to Folk as well. So you should give it a listen. Cool. And all of their episodes are fairly short. They're under 20 minutes. So it's very okay. easy to binge them. Yeah, especially if you have like, if you're driving and you just have quick errands. Or if you're taking a walk and enjoying the beautiful mm -hmm. weather. If you have beautiful weather where you're at. Yep. Like us, finally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And this week's listener question comes from the Misfits and Mysteries podcast. Okay. And they would like to know, how many cattle would it take for me to trade for my freedom if I murdered someone in 2000 BC? Ooh. Where? <laughs> I don't know. I'm picturing, for some like reason, Rome? I was picturing like Mesopotamia, like that kind of area yeah. of the world. Yeah, I was I was picturing Rome. So how many cattle would it take, Maddie? Ooh. If you committed murder. It depends on who you murdered. That's fair. Like if you murdered somebody who was like also an enemy of the state, like two. But if you committed murder of someone who was a friend of the state, it'd be like a thousand. I'd be like... Crazy and unattainable. I like bonds. Hmm. Except California. 
What about you? What do you, what do you think? Well, cows were pretty important back then. Mm-hmm. And we're worth a lot. So I'm going to say like five. Yeah. Give them five cows. On that note, what's something good you'd like to share this week? Something good. One thing, there's a couple like health things that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. So I'm a type one diabetic. And one of the issues that you can have is getting low blood sugar at night. It can be really dangerous if you don't wake up and you get too low, you could go unconscious. And it's also incredibly disruptive when you have low blood sugar in the middle of the night and have to wake up and like drink juice or eat something and then go back to sleep. And then your body's digesting it when you're not supposed to be digesting anything. So I recently met with my doctor and we changed my numbers and I've had low free nights for almost five days now. So that's really exciting. That's going to save, like I'm finally sleeping better for the first time in like two years. Nice. So that's really cool. And then I finally get to do a food allergy test and I'm really excited because I know I'm allergic to something that I eat regularly, but I don't know what it is. And I didn't want to do the elimination diet because I feel like I can't rely on myself to pick what I'm allergic to. I'd rather have a lab, Mm -hmm. like a professional lab and a doctor confirm. That's fair. I'm really excited to kind of see what that is and whether or not I'll listen to it based on what the food is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm starting to feel better. So that's my good thing this week. Good. What about you? I have something kind of similar where I did a 36 hour fast earlier this week. And part of why I wanted to do that is because I was diagnosed a couple of years ago with some sort of digestive issue that I cannot remember the name of because it was something that I couldn't pronounce anyway. And um, basically, it's just where I had allergies to certain types of foods and my small intestine would basically like attack itself trying to digest what I was allergic to. So I kind of wanted to jumpstart a new, not necessarily a diet, but just a way to kind of listen to the guidelines for that disease. Yep. So part of the guidelines of that is I have to eliminate gluten and dairy and I can't have foods that are hard to digest like nuts and corn. Mm -hmm. I can't have foods that would make you gassy like beans. So it's sort of like a keto diet, but without Mm -hmm. the dairy. And so far it's been going pretty well. I've been trying to drink a lot of water and I have noticed that a lot of my bloating has gone down, which is good. That's so good. I haven't weighed myself recently. I only weigh myself once a week because I don't want to be obsessive about it. Yeah. But I've been cutting down my calories. I've been counting calories, which isn't an exact science, but it at least kind of gives you an estimate of what's okay to eat and gives you a better idea of how much you should. It's a way of ensuring you're getting enough calories with your new diet. Mm -hmm. And also kind of teaching you what sort of portions are okay Mm -hmm. to get those calories without going overboard. Yeah. So I did slip up last night with what I ate. And I'm kind of regretting it today. Not feeling great? I'm not sick, but my stomach's not super happy with me. So yeah. I'm going to take it easy the next couple of days. Yeah. It's not a slip up though. You're just human. Well, and it's just relearning what I can and cannot eat. Because for mm-hmm. 36 years of my life, I was able to eat certain things. Or 35 years of my life, I was able to eat certain things. And now all of a sudden I can't. So it's reteaching it's myself. And it's hard. There's not a lot of meal options out there that match all of my dietary restrictions now. So I have to really be mindful of what I eat whenever we make a Taco Bell run or whatever we're going to do. So, yeah. So I just have to be more careful, more mindful, which is good. Well, I'm glad you're doing that, too. It's really like gut health is so important and there's so little we know about it. Like I, we're both technically doing the same thing. Mm hmm. It's just different ways of going about it. But yeah, I'm sick of feeling sick. So I want to know. And I have a feeling since you have all those allergies that I will probably have similar. We'll see. Huzzah! Yay, jeans! (laughs) Jeans. Jeans. On that note, I'm going to start closing it out. Sounds good.
You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. We are on YouTube. You can find us by searching Yield Crime Podcast. We have a P.O. Box. You can write to us at Yield Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota 55092. You can email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com, which is a great way for you to send us your reviews for our month of March giveaway contest we have going on right now. So if you leave us a rating and review and send us a screenshot, you can be entered into our giveaway. We're going to be having exclusive merch that won't be available in the store, along with other great prizes. The contest runs through March 31st, and we will announce a winner on social on April 1st. It is not going to be an April Fool's joke. It's you will will actually be winning something. This is not an elaborate hoax. And uh, this isn't an elaborate gotcha. And you can submit screenshots of reviews you have given us previously Mm -hmm. prior to March. So if you've already left us a review, just send us a screenshot of it and we will enter you into the contest. Awesome. On that note, I'm going to share a five star review we got from our friends over at Drink Drunk Dead. Oh, I love them. I love them too. They say, such a fun podcast. And by the way, I mean Emily. Emily says, I started on episode five and fell in love. I couldn't stop listening. They pick interesting stories I've never heard of before, which is so appreciated in a genre that is often oversaturated with episodes of the same old stories. They're also freaking hysterical. They get me howling with laughter. These two (laughs) have to be so much fun at any gathering because they are witty AF. Aw, we're actually incredibly awkward. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Isn't that always how it goes? Yeah. Everybody's like, oh my God, you'd be like the life of the party. It's like, no, I'm in the corner petting the dog. (laughs) 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 Whispering about everybody else. Yeah, I'm the person that's like crippled by anxiety. That's trying to avoid conversations with people that... I don't know. And fighting down a panic attack. So super fun. I can't wait until (laughs) I know it's going to be great. No, it'll be it will be good. Yeah. You can support us financially if you're so inclined on buy me a coffee. You can also join our Patreon to get something back for your monetary donation. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. And at that level and all of our levels, you can enjoy ad free bonus content. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to get access to the episodes a day earlier than everybody else, ad free. The higher up you go, if you go to our five, ten, or fifteen dollar tiers, you'll get more content, which includes uh, video outtakes of Maddie and myself. Oh man, those will be rich <laughs> stuff that does not get into the show. And we also include links to some of our guest spots that we've done on other podcasts, so you can. Mm-hmm easily access that all in one handy dandy spot. If you are interested in repping us with some merch, you can do so by buying swag from our Tee Public, and there is mm-hmm. going to be a sale this week, 35% off everything in the store, March 24th through the 26th. So get on it. Awesome. And we also have some exciting news that we cannot share with you right now, but we will as soon as we get the go ahead to do so. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned as it is a big, big deal. And we are, I'm bad at keeping secrets. So I'm like, I'm struggling. We're not pregnant. And we did not get a puppy. (laughs) (laughs) And we didn't win a brand new car. So. (laughs) So. On that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. We will see you next time with another tale as old as crime.